More than a century after his death, the ghost of James Maverick would rise from his grave in an explosion of fury and excitement that would rock the foundations of many crime historians, lecturers and most certainly wannabe detectives, all of whom had spent decades trying to uncover the real identity of the world's most notorious murderer. The grandfather of the modern day serial killer, if you will, that of Jack the Ripper. Good morning everyone and welcome to another Out and video. Now today we're somewhere special and it's somewhere where I've wanted to come to for, well I'd say for at least 20 years plus. Ever since the um, release of a famous diary uh, came out. And we're here at Anfield Cemetery looking for the grave of one James Maybrick. Now, I've always been interested, ever since I can remember, in the story of Jack the Ripper. And it's one of those which I think you either know the story or you most certainly know the name Jack the Ripper. And ever since, like I said, I was a kid and I, I remember reading an article in a book, I think it was Unsolved Mysteries or Unsolved Murders of the Times. And there was, I think, three, four page segments about Jack the Ripper and I read it over and over and over. Um, and I must have only been about nine, ten at the time. So for a long time, for many years, I've always been enthralled in the mystery of who Jack the Ripper was. And I think it was 90, 91, a diary came out, supposedly written by the man himself. Now, um, as we walk around Anfield Cemetery, we'll go a little bit deeper into the diary itself, where it was found. Like I said, who the author may or may not have been. Um, but as the thumbnail of this video clearly shows, we are visiting the grave of Jack the Ripper. So over the years, there's been many, many books written on Jack the Ripper with many suspects obviously being mentioned um, and I think there's roughly between two maybe 300 suspects in total some of them obviously a lot of people have already heard of such as Aaron Kosminski, Montague, John Druitt, George Chapman, Walter Sickert, Joseph Barnett um, there's others such as Francis Tumblety, Michael Ostrog, and obviously the famous one, obviously, was, which I think everybody seems to think was part of the murders, was Prince Albert Victor. I've never been a, a fan of that theory, to be fair, but uh, yeah, I know a lot of people seem to think he was the Ripper. But when the diary came out, back in the 90s, early 90s, a new name came to the fore, that of James Maybrick. Now we're not going to, get, going to get too deep into the story of James himself today. Um, I'll tell you a few little bits and bats about him but we're not going to delve too deeply because I do have another story penned in about his life and about, um, how can I put it giving too much away, yeah and about his demise if you will, that's all I'll say. But James was a wealthy cotton merchant here in Liverpool. And in the early days, um, he actually formed a company with his younger brother Edwin. And together, they, like I said, they became quite prosperous and wealthy. Now in his younger days, James had travelled over to America on business trips. And I think he was trying to expand the business that he owned with his brother Edwin. But it was also on his way back, um, it was on the SS Baltic, he met a young woman called Florence Chandler. And within the short space of time that they had together on the actual ship coming back to Liverpool, they'd already arranged plans to be married the following year. I mean, it's quite incredible, really. I mean, they'd only known each other for what, a matter of a couple of weeks. Um, and they'd already started to make plans to get married. And they did do. 
the following year they were married at, I think it was St James's Church in London. Um, big grand ceremony and everything. But the marriage was a bit turbulent. Um, Florence herself, she was a lot younger. I think she was 24 years James's age. Eight months later, Florence would give birth, albeit prematurely, to a son they called James Chandler. And not too long after, the Maybricks relocated back to Norfolk, Virginia. However, Maybrick and company soon began to face difficulties, and the family moved back to Liverpool in 1884. Residing in Grassdale, a small suburb of Liverpool, James was becoming worried over financial affairs, heaping stress on not only himself, but also that of his wife, Florence. Two years later, Florence would give birth to a daughter they named Gladys Evelyn, but it appears their marriage was deteriorating at this point, and James was showing signs of substance abuse, something that he had tried to hide from his social circle of affluent friends in and around Liverpool. And by 1888, the Maybricks moved yet again, this time to Battle Crease House in Aigworth, less than a mile away from Grassendale. It appears they had rented the house, which had included several acres of gardens, trees, and also included a large pond. Perhaps by moving into Battle Crease House, it was more of a statement that tried to prove James's stature within Liverpool. But in reality, the marriage of James and Florence had become unrepairable. James had become withdrawn, but would often have violent outbursts, and his reliance on arsenic had begun to consume him. Now, if you can hear the bagpipes, somebody's obviously playing them in this direction, so I do apologise for the possible background noise during um, this video, but there's obviously some kind of service going on. I guess with the Queen's Jubilee event starting to take place from today onwards, things like that we can expect, so yeah, I do apologise for the background noise, it does make it difficult to, uh, to record. But we'll continue with the story of James Maybrick and how the diary itself came into the public domain. Florence, she was, I think, about 24 years younger than what James was. Um, but with James being a lot older, a lot more mature, he also spent a lot of time away from home, if you will, either on business trips or visiting his brother Michael in London. Now, perhaps it was naivety, um, we don't know obviously, but obviously with Florence being a lot younger, she probably didn't stand in his way and she just let him get on with doing what he was doing. But um, James himself was known for being a bit of a womaniser. Um, he met several women and there was some rumour and some stories that he was, already he was already married to another lady. But it seems that Florence found out about, obviously, his ways and she became unhappy and rows used to ensue from it. Um, but James was also taking a lot of arsenic, um, a lot of poisons. It was like, a, it was, well, it was a drug to him. He couldn't get enough of it. But it seems that it was this poison, this, this arsenic, strychnine, things like that, all it was doing was it was slowly killing him. The diary makes many references to Florence Maybrick having secret liaisons with another man, but whilst his name never appears in any form of text, we now know historically that this man was called Alfred Briley, a young cotton broker. It seems that Florence was aware that James had, himself, been involved in extramarital affairs during the course of their marriage, and along with the abuse she was receiving at the hands of James, we can only assume she found solace in the arms of another man. What makes this compelling is the fact that James Maybick found out about Florence's infidelity and flew into an almighty rage, and the diary shows a glimpse into the mind of the writer. Foolish bitch. I know for certain she has arranged a rendezvous with him in Whitechapel. So be it. My mind is firmly made. I took refreshment at the post house. It was there I finally decided London it shall be. And why not? Is it not an ideal location? Indeed, do I not frequently visit the capital, and indeed do I have a legitimate reason for doing? All who sell their dirty words shall pay. Of that I have no doubt. But shall I pay? I think not. I am too clever for that. So the diary, it came out, in the, like I said, in the early 90s when um, some workmen were working, doing some renovations at a house called Battle Crease House. Now, Battle Crease House was the former home of James and Florence Maybrick. Um, and it was whilst the workman was in one of the bedrooms, which 
ultimately we found out was James Maybrick's bedroom, as they were digging up the floorboards, they came across this old manuscript. Uh, now, the manuscript had many pages ripped out missing, but there was also several pages of handwritten text. Now, it's what was written in those pages that turned a lot of heads. Um, more so than the guy that who he came into possession of the diary, a guy called Michael Barrett. Now his story, again, we're not going to get into too deeply, only because there's a lot of inconsistencies with his story. From the day it broke in the 90s, I think it was the Liverpool Daily Echo or Liverpool Daily News, the newspaper released the story, but then all hell broke loose. And Michael's story seemed to change from one month, from one year to the next. So there's a lot of inconsistencies in his story and how he came into possession of this diary. But the diary itself, tests were done. A lady by a bit of lady by the name of Shirley Harrison um, came uh, took well took possession of it, if you will, through one of her agents from London. Um, and she had all these tests done, you know, the, the paper was tested for its age, the inks used in the diary uh, were tested. And again, there seems to be a lot of inconsistencies with it um because the initial reports came back saying that the dates did seem to correspond with the late 1800s early 1900s um but then obviously you read some articles and some people say no it was in the 50s 60s it was quite a recent hoax whichever way you look at it the diary itself is a physical entity the diary is real in that sense now when the research into the diary was made as to who could possibly have written it everything pointed to James Maybrick you know from like I said the written text the way it talk about his brothers Edwin and Michael obviously it points to the to the rich cotton merchant James um, but a bombshell book came out I think it was 2015 and written by Bruce Dickinson and he basically turned the old world of Ripperology upside down and he brought a new name into the equation. So whilst everybody was thinking James Maybrick was the author of the diary and if that is the case and we take the diary to be real then James Maybrick was Jack the Ripper or was he? Now we just stood outside one of the two mausoleums here in uh, Anfield Cemetery now obviously we can't get into it um, for whatever reasons as you can see it's all padlocked but um, just to look at it you can tell it's old you've got the years of the people who were interred here I mean what was that 1820 1893 but yeah, we can't get into it. But this is just one of two mausoleums, and it's the second mausoleum, which is just further up there, where James's final resting place is. It's on the right hand side. I won't get there shortly. Now, whilst we're here at the cemetery, we might as well have a look around at some of the graves and headstones. And look at this one that's just been pointed out to me. It's got like big lion's claws, lion's feet holding onto it. Um, it's quite a peculiar stone, headstone. But yeah, um, that's quite unique. At the time of the first murder in Whitechapel, the Maybricks marriage was in tatters and it seems plausible that James and Florence were now sleeping in separate bedrooms and they would do so for the remainder of the now short time he had left before his death later in 1889. James was also well aware of Florence's flirtations with another man, just as the diary indicates, but we do have to question who else may have been aware of Florence's secret rendezvous with Alfred Briley. James, it seemed, had a very close relationship with both of his brothers, Edwin and Michael and it is the latter that the diary mentions on quite a few occasions. It appears that James had met Michael numerous times either in Whitechapel, London during the time of the Ripper murders as well as Battle Crease House in Liverpool 
I guess, therefore, it is safe to assume that James would have told Michael about his troubles with Florence, as well as mentioning her relationship with Alfred Briley. Now, the interesting thing about, um, about James Maybrick, we know for a fact that he used to travel to and from London quite regularly. Um, he used to go to the Whitechapel districts, that we know. Now, he also used to visit his older brother, Michael. Now, Michael himself was famous in his own right. Um, he was a famous singer-songwriter back in the day, really popular. But he used to go under the pseudonym of Stephen Adams. Now, it's been written, like I said, by Bruce Robinson in a book, They All Love Jack, um, that Michael himself may well have been the real Jack the Ripper, or the Jack the Ripper. It came out of nowhere, but the book itself, it's 800 plus pages thick, it really is detailed. Okay, there is some flaws in it, there is some factual flaws, which we won't go into just now, but when you read the book itself, and you put two and two together, and you link Michael with James, obviously being very close brothers, and James used to tell Michael everything that was going on in his life, then you've got to look at the diary, look at the handwritten notes, and think to yourself, perhaps there's some element of truth in it. Perhaps James was innocent after all of the brutalities that took place in the Autumn of Terror. Perhaps it was his brother, and for whatever reason, James was being set up, but why? So you're all thinking now, Chris, why would someone have got the way to frame the brother of being Jack the Ripper? Now, the story is both James and Michael were Freemasons of the highest order. And the Freemasons knew, the head of the Freemasons knew who the actual killer was all along. Now, obviously you've got to think, these were powerful people back in the day. The police, the police commissioner, the judges, doctors, all the top politicians, they were all part of Masons back in the day, back at, you know, part of the Freemasons. So if one of their own came out to be identified as being Jack the Ripper, it probably would have brought not obviously just shame on the, on the entire organisation, but it's the ramifications long term which obviously would have, 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 have arose from such allegations. And in Bruce Robinson's book, it seems that um, he thinks that the Masons were covering up Michael Maybrick's tracks all along. And we'll get more into that shortly. But you've got to ask, why would Michael still try to pin it on his brother by writing a diary, writing the memoirs of Jack the Ripper, if you will? Now, let's remember, right, James passed away and there was a lot of furor over it at the time. Again, this is a story we're going to get into with Florence, so I'm not going to go too much into it today. But Michael had a hatred for women. He had a deep hatred for women, but it seems he had a bigger hatred for Florence Maybrick, James's wife. Now, there's a lot of contradictions with Michael in that we know factually he preferred being in the presence of men. He was a homosexual and like i said he hated women now he might have had a lot more hatred for florence because of the meetings with james and james would have told all about her flirtations with another man called alfred briley now this could have enraged michael even more uh, because it's his brother that she was harming we don't know this is just all you know i'm just presuming this could have happened who's to say that michael Perhaps so he wouldn't get caught himself, you know, being Jack the Ripper. He could quite have easily concocted this diary, this manuscript, pointing everything to his brother James, because if James is no longer around, nothing untowards could come of the family, maybe, or of James himself, because obviously he's dead. So the heat's off Michael. Again, this is only guesswork, it's only my own thoughts. Michael didn't have anything to lose, did he, by putting the blame onto his brother, and his brother obviously being dead, couldn't face the consequences. It seems plausible, um, maybe a bit out there, but you've got to remember, Michael, 
he will have known all about James, all about the issues that he had with drugs, with the use of arsenic, the issues he had with Florence. He didn't know all these things. So in the diary, all these little paragraphs which relate to how can I put it without giving too much away? But all, all these issues, all these things about um, Flory or Florence going meeting her lover, Alfred Briley. Michael would have known about all this because James would have told him during his visits to, to Whitechapel. Um, tell me your thoughts again on that down below. Is it plausible uh, that uh, Michael could well have written the diary based on the information given by James? And also, if, if Michael was Jack the Ripper, he knew full well the dates, the times, the victims, how he did the murders, because he was the murderer, well, obviously. Now, I know from watching a few YouTube videos over the last few months leading up to us visiting Anfield Cemetery that James's uh, headstone or the family headstone has been defaced quite badly um, and I think it's still in the same position as it was in one of the videos I watched uh, a couple of months ago um, it's a shame really but it seems to be that ever since um, a documentary came out, the Diary of Jack the Ripper, that vandals have uh, been down and they've properly smashed up the actual headstone. And yeah, I mean, it's coming up now, you can see it. It's just here. But this is uh, the final resting place of James Maybrick. You can see William Maybrick, who was his father, born. 15th of April is it 1815 died 28th of July is it or June 1870 um, Susanna is there but this is the name that we've come for isn't it and you've got also James which is just there so this is the final resting place of Jack the Ripper Now, I'm not going to lie, but it does seem a bit... It feels really surreal being here after all these years of wanting to visit James's final resting place. Like I said, he died May is it the 11th, 1889. But this, if we are led to believe the diary is correct, is this is the final resting place of Jack the Ripper himself, the world's most notorious serial killer. And it does feel surreal, it really does. I mean, people will obviously have their own opinions on, on who Jack the Ripper was, and that's fine, that's fine, that's absolutely fine. You know, we all have our own thoughts and ideas and our own beliefs. I'm kind of on the fence, I'm not going to lie. But yeah, just to be here at possibly Jack the Ripper's final resting place, James Maybrick, it is a surreal moment. But as you can see, it's a shame that is the headstone has been vandalised. Because it's not just him that's uh, obviously buried here. There's other family members. Yeah, it's, uh, it's surreal, it really is.
supposed to be here at the final resting place. It's um, it's quite spooky because so much has been written about Jack the Ripper and who he was and the diary. If if it is true and if it was written by James, then we are looking at the final resting place of Jack the Ripper, uh, no matter what anybody says. Now, we have to take the diary at face value, but we have to read between the lines of what is incorporated in the text. There's a lot of things which I personally, I personally find a bit strange. Like a man who is an habitual user of arsenic of poisons can write such clearly handwritten texts. Okay, some of it might be scrawled out and it's been rewritten like the poems. And this is the other side of the diary, which I find quite strange. There's a lot of poems in the diary. Now we've got to remember that Michael, his brother, was a famous singer-songwriter, well known for penning songs, penning um, verses. Now, for those who know about Jack the Ripper, will obviously know about the Golston Street Graffiti. And for those that don't know about it, well, the Golston Greek Street uh, Graffiti was written on the wall after the murder of one of the five canonical victims. Now, it said something on the lines of the Jews are the men who will not be blamed for nothing, or something like that. Now. I look at that and I think to myself, would a man who is drugged up, who's manic, be able to write such, what's the word I'm looking for? Not inspiring, obviously, but um, but such strong phrases such as that. Another man could, such as Michael, who is well-versed in writing poems, songs, things like that. Somebody with a knack of writing so easily. Michael, definitely could have wrote them words 100% could have wrote them words and it makes sense the way Jews were spent uh, was spelt J U W E S it's not Jews as in J E W S blaming the Jews but it was spelt J U W E S now that apparently is a reference to the Freemasons I think it's Jubilo, Jubellum and there's a third one I put the names down below but that is a Freemason word, Jews. And apparently, Sir Charles Warren, the police commissioner at the time, knew full well that whoever had written the Golston Street graffiti, he knew full well that it was written by a Mason, and that is why he had it washed off the wall at the time. Not, obviously, to stop the foreigners back in the day, the Jews, the Polish, or whatever, in, in Whitechapel from kicking up a stink, because obviously one of theirs was being blamed for being the murderer. Oh, okay, that could have been the case as well. But he knew full well that the word Jews, that was a big indicator to the press and everybody else that this was a man of in intellect, intelligence. It was written by a Freemason, one of his own. So in the diary, it also leaves subtle clues as to the identity of Jack the Ripper. And the writer of the diary, whether it be James, Michael or somebody else, gives us two examples. And I think one of them was Catherine Eddowes. Now when the police found her body, she had two inverted V's cut into a cheekbone just under her eyes. And when you put the two V's together, inverted, they form the letter M. Michael, maybe, or does it mean Maybrick? Now, also, the final canonical victim of Mary Jane Kelly, she was found in her lodgings and she was obliterated. Now, I'm going to put a photograph up of that scene. So, if you're a bit screamish and you don't like things like that, turn away now. But for the next couple of minutes, there's going to be a photograph while we do a voiceover. So, basically, as I just said, the, vic the victim, Mary Jane Kelly, she was obliterated. Now, she was the only victim to have been found inside her own dwellings. And it gave the Ripper plenty of time to do what he did to her during either the late hours, early hours of the morning. There was nothing left of her. Her body was ripped to shreds. Um, 
But interestingly, there was blood splatters on the wall close to the bedside where she was lying. And in amongst the blood splatters, many seem to think they can see the letter M. Now we'll zoom in on that and tell me what you think. Whether or not it's just our brain trying to process what we're seeing to make something that oh, that isn't there, that could well be the, the, the issue. But let's just presume for a minute that Jack the Ripper did leave that clue. He left the letter M in blood on the wall. A lot of people seem to think that it ties in with James Maybrick, M being for Maybrick. But let's just flip it on its head and just presume for one minute that Michael Maybrick was indeed Jack the Ripper. And it was him himself that had left his initial for Michael. Not for Maybrick, but for Michael, M. It does make sense, it's plausible. Tell me what you think down below, if, uh, if you kind of see where I'm going with that. Now, for those that have obviously looked away because it's a bit screamish, can come back to the to the video now. But yeah, tell me what you uh, what you think of that down below. Could Michael have been Jack the Ripper? It really is a fascinating thought. Now, during the, the reign of the Ripper murders, the police, the Metropolitan Police, as well as obviously the news reports at the time, news outlets, they all received hundreds of letters. Many of them were hoaxes, without a doubt. But in the book, they all love Jack by Bruce Robinson. It does imply that some of these hoax letters were in fact written by the man himself, Jack the Ripper. Now we've got to remember that Michael Maybrick used to travel around the country, Manchester, Leeds, Sunderland, Newcastle, obviously London, um, Bradford. Now a murder took place in December 1888 where the body of a young boy called Johnny Gill was discovered and he was cut to be pieces. Again, this isn't for the light hearted but um, his body was cut to pieces, all his limbs cut off. But more interestingly, when the police found the body, apparently he had either his arms or his legs like put over his shoulder, like a, a cross, if you were like a skull and crossbone. Now, this was a known logo for the Freemasons back in the day, probably still is today. Now, again, it's another clue to the mind of the Ripper, if it was Michael Maybrick, high-ranked high Freemason. Was he mocking the Freemasons? Was he mocking the police by giving these clues the initials, the way Johnny Gill's um, body was laid out. Now, why do I think Johnny Gill is part of the Ripper murder as well? At the time, the press reports all said Jack the Ripper had been in Bradford. It's a Jack the Ripper atrocity. You know, they all went into Jack the Ripper. And it appears that Michael Maybrick himself was in Bradford in or around the time of the Johnny Gill murder. Now, like I said, Michael travelled these places. He could have easily written these hoaxes, if you will, these letters, and sent them from these towns and cities to the Metropolitan Police, to the news outlets. But the police instantly shut them down as being hoaxes. Why? Well, because the police at the very top themselves were masons, and if they, re if they revealed that one of their own was doing the murders, all hell would have brought loose. So it was in their interest to instantly shut down all the letters saying they were hoaxes. It's a fascinating idea when you think about it, it really is. So do I believe that uh, James Maybrick was Jack the Ripper? Do I believe that the diary was written by him? 50-50. Do I believe Michael Maybrick could have been Jack the Ripper and wrote the diary? I'm kind of 60-40, 70-30 on that. Everything seems to point to Michael more than it does James in my opinion. Obviously, there could be other Ripper um, suspects out there who have already been named, who could well have been Jack the Ripper. Quite plausible. Um, give me your thoughts down below. Tell me what you think. Who you actually think Jack the Ripper was. Doesn't necessarily have to be anything to do with this story, but um, yeah, if, you've, if you're a keen interest in the Ripper, if you're a Ripperologist, you know, let me know your thoughts down below, what you think. Is it plausible Michael Maybrick could well have set his brother up, James? Is it plausible James maybe it could have been Jack the Ripper? I'd be interested to know your thoughts down below. So as we leave Anfield Cemetery, I can't stop but looking in said direction where James and his family lay. Um, it's quite surreal thinking that this could well be the, the ultimate place to visit if you're a Ripperologist or if we're to believe that, obviously, James was Jack the Ripper. Well, pigeons joining us. Is it a sign? 
Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it really is probably one of the best cemeteries, unique cemeteries that I've visited in a long while. It's well maintained, there's a lot of graves, a lot of old graves, a lot of new graves. Plenty of stories, as uh, we said when we visit these places. But uh, yeah, quite is a, a place to visit. And like I said, the mausoleum's just directly in front. So like I said, if you make your way from the church itself, come down the pathway, walk around, and just follow this path past the first mausoleum, immediately on your right, you'll come across uh, James's uh, headstone. But yeah, it's a fascinating story, and it's one I'll keep uh, coming back to. We'll probably do more videos, perhaps, on more suspects, more of the victims, maybe. I mean, one of these days, I would love to uh, to get down to Whitechapel in London and visit all the places and do it, uh, do the story justice, you know. Um, but we'll see. That that's for another year, maybe. Definitely not this year because there's holidays. But uh, yeah, uh, definitely come back to this uh, cemetery. Definitely go to Whitechapel at some point and do the full story and visit the final resting places of the victims, hopefully. So we're going to leave it here now at Anfield Cemetery. It's been an interesting outing. I do hope you enjoyed this story. It's one I really look forward to uh, covering. Um, like I said, I've been interested in this story since I was a kid back in the day, and it's just stuck with me all these years. But if you did enjoy the story, guys, like I said, comment down below. Tell me your thoughts on who the Ripper were and the thoughts on this video as in general. But in the meantime, from this glorious cemetery here in Liverpool, and it really is... Take care, look after yourselves, and as I always say, we'll be back soon with another tale from our glorious but really disturbing past. <laughs>